What if you could get the same results from a cost-effective camera that you could from a $5,000 camera? And that doesn't even include the lens. In this David vs. Goliath video, we are going to be pitting the Lumix S52X against the Sony A7S III, which is the king in a lot of ways, and we're going to be putting them through real life scenarios. Not just talking about specs and blabbing away about this, that, and the other thing. We're going to go use them, and we're going to talk about which have what benefits in certain areas. Now, a lot of us are enthusiasts. Not everyone gets paid to do photography or videography. So that's what we're gonna talk about from a very practical standpoint. If you guys are professionals, you probably already know what type of specs you need from a camera and probably already have it in your arsenal. But for the rest of us, I'm gonna talk to you guys about the real life practical use cases for these cameras. Let's talk about the cost breakdown. The Sony a7S III body starts at $4,800 here in Canada. That is without a lens, so you still can't use it and you still need a pretty expensive memory card to get the most out of that camera. The Lumix S52X, on the other hand, goes for 3,000 Canadian dollars. And they have packed a lot of punch into this tiny and cost-effective camera, such as all eye formats, you can shoot up to ProRes, you can record out to an SSD, and you can shoot out to RAW through the HDMI as well. And it packs a whole bunch of extra professional video features in that camera as well, for being almost $2,000 cheaper. Now the first thing that we really noticed between the Sony and the Lumix was that the image stabilization was vastly different. Now can you figure out which one was better? It was the Lumix. The in-body image stabilization on these cameras is maybe the best in all of the camera categories. When I came back and started editing this footage, I was honestly blown away at how shaky the Sony footage was when I had already looked at the Lumix footage. It's almost unusable on the Sony side. And when you're talking about real life use cases with these cameras, that can actually be a really big deal, being able to practically use handheld footage and not feel the need to have to upgrade to a gimbal, for example, to make sure that you're getting that solid, stable, footage. So in this category, the Lumix is going to take the win for me. Now when it comes to image quality, we were shooting both of these cameras at 422 10-bit codecs in 4K. The Lumix S52X does have the ability to shoot in all I formats and ProRes when you're recording out to an SSD drive, but these file sizes are quite honestly, they're massive, so you have to make sure you have plenty of hard drives on hand when you bring that footage back because one little clip is like 1.9 gigs per second. That's crazy, that's absolutely crazy and potentially unnecessary. So you have to make sure that whatever project you're working on that you are using the correct tool. For most of us, I think that 422 10-bit is a great codec, whether you are shooting in long GOP or all I, I honestly just use the long GOP format in my Lumix camera because it's plenty good enough. And if you wanna shoot up to RAW, you can, but again, for most of us, we're posting to social media or YouTube or whatever it is and don't actually require the depth of color retention that RAW really gives us. So something to consider when you're looking at a camera. When it comes to dynamic range, the Lumix and the Sony actually are very close. The Lumix boasts 14 plus stops of dynamic range and the Sony boasts up to 15 stops of dynamic range. So very, very close in how they can retain highlights and shadows using their log profiles, which was really actually necessary because we were out shooting in very bright conditions. So the ability to retain those highlights and still see some details in those shadow areas was really great. And one thing that I noticed about these two profiles, I actually use the same V-Log to Rec. 709 profile that I've created for both the Lumix and the Sony, and they both looked incredible. The color retention, the way that it brought back the dynamic range was very similar actually. So I actually used that same LUT on all of the footage. I love the V-Log profile. The way that it retains highlights in this camera is, it's beautiful. The roll off is amazing and the highlight retention, you can just get it all back. I, I absolutely love using this camera. And then the low light performance on the Sony, make sure that you're getting all the crispy details in the shadows. So not necessarily a clear winner in this area, at least in my use case when it was super bright and sunny. Now, when it comes to low light shooting, the Sony a7S III is obviously the king. The whole entire internet will tell you that it is the best in low light. But 
The Lumix is no pushover in this area either. It does offer a dual native ISO at 640 and at 4000, which is super usable in real life situations. The Sony a7S III has a crazy dual native ISO. I think it's like up at 12,800 or something. Correct me if you are a Sony user down in the comments, which is awesome because if you're shooting in crazy low light situations, you can get another clean platform to shoot in those low light situations. Additionally, when you add ISO into these cameras, the noise is actually quite manageable. Uh, it doesn't get too gross. It's still usable footage. Whereas when I was using the Canons, the R5 and the R6, they don't have that dual native ISO. So that made it a lot more difficult when you started bringing noise into those images, started looking really icky and actually a lot of times not very usable. So if you're in the Canon ecosystem, you probably wanna go more for like that R5C or something better so you can get like that dual native ISO. So let's get into some of the compromises you might have to make if you go with either one of these cameras. The first one that I wanna talk about is slow motion, is this is where I think that the greatest difference come from with the Sony and the Lumix. The Sony is gonna offer you a ton of slow motion options at high bit rates. So you can shoot at 120 frames per second at 422 10-bit with incredible color retention. Now, if you need that and you shoot a ton of 120 and you need it to be just color rich and awesome, then you need the Sony. But if you honestly didn't even understand the numbers that I just said, then you don't. The Lumix does offer 60 frames per second and 120, but the 60 frames per second is cropped at 4K. Still incredibly usable and a beautiful image because you can shoot at 422 10 bit, but I've even used, practically speaking, the 60 frames per second, 10-bit color retention at 1080p, posted it all over the internet, and y'all aren't any the wiser because you just, you just don't know. Most of us are practically posting to YouTube or social media. But if you are the rare breed that needs those incredibly high bit rates for your professional work, then you might be needing that Sony camera. That was a compromise that I was willing to make with the Lumix is having lower resolution for my slow motion, which I don't shoot a ton of. And when I do, I'm actually okay with the crop on the 60 frames per second 4K. I found it to be very usable and still a really great image. Another compromise that you are going to have to look at is in the photography. Now, the Sony A7S III is not necessarily a photography first camera. It's quite honestly an afterthought. Uh, you have 12 megapixel photos, which practically speaking is very usable. Uh, if you posted that stuff to social media, no one's really gonna be any the wiser. It's gonna look great, the bokeh's gonna look beautiful, and it's all getting compressed down anyway for social media. So if that's all you're using it for, you're plenty good over there. But the Lumix on the other hand has a 24 megapixel, and this means that you can blow up those photos a little bit bigger if you need to. You maybe get a little bit more data in there, but there's pros and cons. It just really depends on where you're gonna end up putting those photos. The reason that the Sony has such a low megapixel count is so that it can bring in all that low light. So that is the compromise, is getting that incredible low light performance, but not having as many megapixels to get a high quality, high resolution photo. Photo. Again, real life usage. I've seen a ton of these photos go out to the internet and no one knows that it's only 12 megapixels. But in this area, I think the Lumix kind of takes the win because it still has incredible low light performance with slightly higher resolution photos as well. Another compromise you have to think about is in the lens costs. So the Sony starts at 4,800 Canadian and that is without a lens. And then if you look at the cost of Sony lenses, they're they're wild, like realistically speaking, it is a significant amount of money to be able to get into the Sony ecosystem. So when I've asked a lot of my friends, hey, would you consider Lumix because I'm a big fan. I'm not paid to say any of this, by the way, but they're like, I can't switch. I'm too invested. I'm in it deep, man. Like they can never move because they're thousands of dollars invested into this company. Where I found the benefit on the Lumix side was I was able to get a body, a lens, and a DJI Mini RS3 gimbal, all for the same price as whoever was buying that Sony body. Absolutely incredible uh, what you get from this little package. And one question I would ask is, can you actually tell the difference between a $3,000 lens and a 
$600 lens? Like when you're scrolling Instagram, can you actually be like, ooh, that was a $3,000 lens right there? I can't. And most of my career has actually been built on budget friendly lenses like the Sigma series or just more cost effective lenses like the Lumix lenses that I have here are $600 and $800 and I shoot a ton of professional work with it. So when we really consider the real practical implications of how we use our cameras and where we are posting the content that we're shooting with it, I think it's pretty interesting to consider the pros and cons when you're just looking at camera bodies and what they're capable of. So our are those compromises worth it for you? Does the cost really balance out? Do you need 120 frames per second at 4K to make sure that all your friends can see how much money you have? If not, well, you can subscribe because I do a lot of Lumix content and you could watch this video here to see me do some POV photography with the Lumix. I hope that this has been insightful. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video, but I hope that you've been a little bit educated today. Again, none of this was sponsored by anyone. I think it's just interesting to have real world opinions on these cameras. Cool. Take care guys. Peace.